This is Incredible Stories Podcast, Episode 10, Palagra, the Corn Epidemic. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me again today on Incredible Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Virila. Want to learn something new? Good. I got you something new. Or at least this topic was new to me. Now, I hadn't heard of this particular incident, and that incident being the Pellagra incident. And what that was, it was an epidemic that afflicted mostly the southern United States. It's a story involving corn, politics, and science. Ooh, what intrigue you're saying. I know. I will continue. So, Pellagra, what's that? Josh, what, what's Pellagra about? What's the what what? Well, I'll give you the what what. Let's dive a deeper, shall we? Pellagra is a disease. A horrible, gross one. They call it the four Ds. And I'll give you a second to... Guess what those 4Ds might be? Okay, time's up. Sorry if you weren't quick enough. So the 4Ds uh, stand for diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death. But let's WebMD this, shall we? Get a little bit deeper on it. Here are some additional symptoms. So if you have pellagra, you might have sensitivity to sunlight and other psychomotor disturbances like intolerance to odors and sudden movements, aggression, hair loss, swelling, lesions, insomnia, confusion, loss of coordination, an enlarged heart, the list goes on, etc, etc. Now eventually, you'll progress to dementia and maybe even death. And if you didn't die, you'd be left with an incurable dementia, that is if it progressed to that stage. Now, the gross skin conditions caused by pellagra was first described in 1735 in Spain by Gaspar Casal, and he thought the condition was caused by poor diet and atmospheric influences, I, I guess like thunderstorms and tornadoes. His work was published, but not until 1762, and was referred to as Asturian leprosy. It was called this because this disease was prevalent among the ethnic Asturians of a region in northern Spain known as Asturias. Yes, very good class. So Pellagra also showed up a lot in northern Italy. And this is where it gets its name Pele meaning skin and Agra meaning sour. Sour skin, very yummy. On a side note, how delicious are pudding skins. I might be in the minority of this, but I like when my pudding has skin on it. But <laughs> continuing on with pellagra. In the 1880s, pellagra affected 100,000 people in Italy, and they didn't know what to make of this disease. Was it a form of scurvy, a type of elephantitis, or something else, something new? Aliens? And, and what caused this disease? Pirates? Elephants? Aliens? All right, not aliens. Now, in the early 1900s, pellagra started to become a big problem in America, specifically the American South. And between 1906 and 1940, about 3 million people came down with pellagra, and more than 100,000 people died from it. It's an epidemic, y'all. A mystery epidemic that first appeared with a single case in Georgia in 1902 and quickly spread across the South. By 1912, 30,000 people had pellagra in South Carolina and this disease had a nearly 40% mortality rate. That's very high. So what does Northern Spain, Northern Italy, and the American South have in common? I'll give you a hint. What a lovely dinner prepared for us today. Could you please pass the brania, por favor? Mamma mia! This polenta is fantastico! 
but I'm sure I'm getting tired of eating this all of the time. Dang, y'all. I'm sick of all this calm bread. Can y'all pass me those grits instead? So aside from all my poorly acted weird accents, the things all these pelagra places had in common was they consumed a lot of corn. Aha! So all the scientists said, you know what, this pelagra thing must be caused by some germ, or an insect, or a toxin in the corn. Well now, in 1914, Congress said, let's get our Surgeon General on the case and figure this sum of bitch out. So the Surgeon General assigns Dr. Joseph Goldberger to study this crazy little thing called pellagra. Now, by the time Goldberger starts working this thing, tens of thousands of people had died in the South. So the leading theory was some bacteria was causing this disease and Goldberger wanted to check out what was happening firsthand in person, live. So he starts traveling around the rural South, which is where most people who had pellagra lived. So he'd go to places like Podunk, South Carolina, East Bumblescum, and Whiskey Spit. But no matter where he went, he saw the same thing. He saw poor, very poor workers. He even visited insane asylums because more and more reports of people with pellagra were popping up here and in orphanages and other state institutions like prisons. Now, of course, one of the progressions of pellagra is dementia. So, so this might explain some of the increases at the uh, you know, insane asylums. But Goldberger went door to door interviewing people and collected data, sweet, sweet data, and noted young children between 6 and 12 years of age and women seemed to get pellagra more often. Although the caregivers, like nurses and doctors, were not coming down with this affliction. He also noted that poor farmers, and just farmers in general, were not typically afflicted with pellagra, or had very low rates of this disease. So, Goldberger pondered, well, surely this isn't a germ? Germs wouldn't know how to tell who is a farmer, a caregiver, a rich person? and why inmates in the low rung of society were getting this, he couldn't, he couldn't say. So, you know, basically, you know, he's saying germs can't differentiate between classes of people. So you would see a lot more of the other echelons of society getting infected with this, but that was not the case. So being an educated doctor of the time, he knew of things like vitamins and other diseases like scurvy were tied to vitamin deficiencies. He thought perhaps this might be the cause. At the turn of the 20th century, textile mills and other factories began to boom. Production of yarn and clothing, for example. In fact, by the 1920s, more people in the South worked in textile mills than they did any other occupation. Whole families would work in the mills, from the husbands, wives, and children. Interestingly, at one point, nearly one quarter of textile labor was done by children under the age of 16 in the South. Often, mills would build towns for the workers to live in, but these conditions were often bad and tightly packed and very controlled. Now, the Southern diet consisted a lot of corn, and especially in the poorer communities. It was cheap, easy, and abundant. Most poor of the time ate diets heavy in cornbread, cornmeal, grits, and molasses. Yay, corn! Of course, the more well-to-do supervisors, managers, those type of people, could afford to eat more meats and veggies. And farmers usually ate dairy, veggies, and meat they grew themselves. Now, before I go further, let's take a little side trip on corn and, and the history thereof. We probably have all eaten corn. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's in a lot of products, but it's a bit mysterious. The origin of corn, somewhat of a head scratcher. You only see corn in farms nowadays, but about 10,000 years ago, people began domesticating plants 
weeds, these, you know, types of food, grainy plants, etc. And, and you see most of their wild ancestors you can still find in the wild today. So like wild weed, wild rice, etc. But you don't find wild corn. It is thought that the original domestication of corn came from a wild grass called teosinte and was first seen about 9,000 years ago in the southwestern part of Mexico near the Balsas River. Now, early American cultures adopted and used corn and often used a process called nixtamalization, which is taking the corn, soaking and cooking it in an alkaline solution like lime water. And, and that's lime water as in a solution of calcium hydroxide, not the fruit. And this could be made from throwing things like limestone or seashells on a fire and burning it. Ash could also be used to create this alkaline solution. Okay, so what nixtamalization did was make corn easier to grind and increase its flavor, smell, and nutritional value by unlocking vitamins like niacin or vitamin B. And there's a bunch of science stuff here, so I won't get into that. But if you're interested in those details, you can Google it. But another big benefit of this nixtamalization process was that cornmeal would be able to be formed into dough when water is added to it. And cornmeal is just coarse flour made from ground up dried corn. So you can make tortillas, tamales, hominy, etc. Alrighty, so Christopher Columbus comes over and soon corn is introduced to Europe and such societies. But they didn't use corn or the same processing methods that the Mesoamericans and Native American people used. Okay, so now back to Dr. Joseph Goldberger. Suspecting the corn-rich diet is undernourishing people who get pellagra, he decided to start feeding kids in orphanage a supplemented diet, adding to their meager corn-based diet, meats and vegetables and milk. Well, surprise, surprise, the kids who had pellagra got better, and other kids weren't developing the disease. Okay, so he figured out how to cure it, but still didn't understand it fully. So he devised another experiment. Let me see if I can give people pellagra, he says. So he goes to the governor in Mississippi and says, Governor, if you let me have some prisoners, I want to see if I can actually give them pellagra by changing their diet. So the governor says, why that sounds bully. So to persuade the prisoners, they offered pardons to anyone who completed the experiment. Sounds good, sign me up, man. So he goes to the prison that has no current pellagra cases and, and isolates the prisoners. So Dr. Goldberger was able to give seven of the 11 prisoners in his care, uh, in his pellagra experiment, within six months, he was able to give them pellagra. Yay, success! Of course, the doctor tells the prisoners how to reverse this by eating his meat, milk, and vegetables. You know, basically uh, diversifying their diets. Now, this is significant. By doing all these experiments, he proved that pellagra was in fact not an infectious disease and linked to poverty and diet. So, I'm sure the doctor was thinking something like this. Step one, cure pellagra. Step two, cause pellagra. Step three, get carried around the country on people's shoulders with admiration. Well, unlike Meatloaf's song, two out of three is kind of bad. And while Dr. Goldberger expected a groundswell of public support, all he heard was crickets. In fact, people even got mad at him. So government officials and, you know, just other people in general said he was hoaxing the poor of the South. And because he linked the program to the poor working people, they thought he was being a city snob and denounced him. Science! Boo, you city slickers go home. That's pretty much what they said. So that's what he did. He went back to his lab and tried to figure out what was the actual root cause of the disease. For you see, he figured out how to treat and give people this thing, but he wasn't entirely clear on what the trigger was. And the cause? Well, remember the nixtamalization process the Native Americans and Mesoamericans used when processing their cornmeal? 
Well, Americans never did this as treating corn with lime and such wasn't a part of their culture. So when they lived on a diet of untreated corn, their bodies couldn't absorb the needed amount of niacin. And this sadly, Dr. Goldberg wouldn't live to hear about. Uh, he never found out what the root cause of this disease was. Because scientists didn't figure it out until eight years after Dr. Goldberger died from kidney cancer in 1929. But they did begin to add niacin to food in 1938. So, no one gets pelagra anymore, and it's probably why you've never heard of it. But don't feel too bad for Dr. G. Upon his death, his wife received a $125 a month pension thanks to Congress passing a special bill recognizing his work, and he has been nominated five times for the Nobel Prize. Now, I started off the podcast by calling this an incident, and it's an incident because we weren't nearly as blindsided by this as it may appear. For you see, we stand on the shoulders of giants. The odd thing, remember I mentioned earlier Gaspar Casal, the Spanish guy who first described Pelagra? Well, it seems that he too found prescribing milk, cheese, eggs, and meat to people's diets halted the disease. Although he didn't attribute Pelagra to food deficiencies, it was a similar conclusion to that of Dr. Goldberger nearly 158 years later. Why didn't his work get more attention? Well, this disease, like the southern epidemic, affected poor rural parts of Spain and other parts of Europe, so I guess people didn't really care. Because, you know, it only affected poor people, so eh, it's no big deal. We don't need a, yeah, we don't need poor people, eh. So, also, there was an Italian named Francesco Frappoli, and he described the, the disease in the 1770s and found that it was not contagious and cured by a robust diet as well. Two more Italians in 1776, Jacopo Odardi, said, hey, this pellagra thing is from too much corn. And in 1789, Francesco Fanzago linked the disease to a polenta diet or, you know, eating too much polenta. Again, he, he advocated for a varied diet. In fact, Francesco Fanzago pushed a campaign for a varied diet. But like Dr. Goldberger, the government told him to shut up. Corn alternatives were more expensive, so telling poor people to switch to wheat would cause a bit of a problem. And in 1810, even a fourth Italian, Giovanni Battista Marzari, suggested corn lacked something and may be a deficiency-related disease. Man, these Italians were on it like white on rice or red sauce on pasta. Now, the French had more political success, and in 1866, and this guy has quite a name, Jean-Baptiste Victor Theophile Rossel, I'm just going to call him J.P., got the French government to put a limit on corn acreage that could be planted. And so what this did is it forced people to plant other things like grains and veggies, etc. So it, it varied their diet. So they all kind of came to the same conclusion and had parts of the Pelagra puzzle right, although no one truly nailed it down. So in the USA, the cause of Pelagra wasn't pushed to the public until 1935, many years after a link had been known, and in fact, the U.S. Public Health Service Director, Hugh S. Cummings said, they knew about the cure for pellagra for 20 years. The question is, why didn't they do anything about it? Well, as stated, this disease affected only the really poor populations. F the poor, who cares about them? They were the ones eating all the corn because that was what they could afford. You know, so the less of them, the better, right? Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. If you think about being a prominent government official from one of the poor southern states and you hear someone say, hey, the way your poor people are living, it's totally wrong. You need to have them change the way they do things completely in order to save them. Well, this wouldn't go over well as it would have a tinge of elitism. Plus, how do you convince a whole population to switch their affordable diet to a more expensive one? You know, especially when they can't afford it. It's hard to do that, but also they were poor, so they weren't considered as important then if, if the disease was affecting a, a, the more affluent. 
But thankfully, eventually, with education and fortification of foodstuff, this disease ceased to be. So that's the story of pellagra and the epidemic you probably haven't heard of. And thankfully, you shouldn't nowadays because it's not really around, you know, thanks to varied diets and, you know, these type of vitamins being added to food, you know, we just don't see it anymore. So I'll leave you guys, as always, with a haiku, a single haiku, standing by itself. Can I have more corn and a side of pellagra? More corn, please. More corn. And that's all for this time, guys. Thanks for listening as always. Check out our main site for other cool stories on IncredibleStoriesPodcast.com. Send me an email or haiku via the, the website. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at IncredPod. Rate us on iTunes. Peep us out on YouTube and Stitcher. For Incredible Stories Podcast, I'm Josh. And remember, the journey of a thousand tales begins with the first word. Yeah.